Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, brief webinar on all about the, the key functions of your calculator for the CFA exam. My name is Simon Holohan, I'm the head of CFA training here at Fitch Learning and we'll be going through the, say, the key functions. I, I will not have time to address the underlying concepts, so I am assuming you know about present value, you know what a standard deviation is, etc. And we're going to focus on making sure you can use the uh, Texas Instruments BA2 Plus calculator as efficiently and accurately as possible. Okay? Uh, we will not be covering every single function, just the, just the main ones. Uh, there is a, obviously a detailed uh, candidate guide on our portal, on the Cognition platform, for those of you who want to, to look at it and that will have every single uh, function on there. But we'll look at the main ones. Uh, this uh, session should take about uh, 45 to 50 minutes in total. Right? So let's uh, start with the basics. Uh, you may have just got your, your new calculator. Um, if you've uh, opened it, well done. The packaging seems to be the strongest thing known to man. Uh, anyway, if you've battled your way through the packaging, opened up your calculator, uh, there's a few things you need to do before you get started. One of the biggest problems you have when it comes out of the factory is it gets set to just two decimal places. And in many calculations, two decimal places simply isn't enough, particularly if you're doing an FX question. As you probably know, virtually every foreign exchange quote has four decimal points. Uh, therefore, if you've got a set of two, you, you, you're not going to... Uh, well, you're going to have potentially rounding issues um, and you may end up picking the wrong answer. Uh, so, let's make sure we can change the um, calculator settings. Now, if you look at your calculator, you'll find obviously you've got your main buttons uh, in front of you, but then on top of each button, in yellow, you have another command. And the way you access these yellow functions is by pressing the bright yellow uh, second button, which is near the top left of your calculator. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to access the uh, format, function, which is basically the decimal point down the bottom, but format is in yellow, so we press the yellow second first. So press second and format, or decimal point. Your display will uh, just say, um, um, just have short for, for decimals, DEC, and it will probably say equals two. Um, there is no prescribed number of decimals uh, laid down by the CF Institute. Uh, we generally would say anywhere from sort of, you know, four or upwards. Uh, personally, I set mine to nine, uh, but you could equally have it uh, to four, to five, whatever. I guess as a happy medium, five would work. So you basically type in the number of decimals you wish to work to, so let's say five. Then hit the enter button. Now please remember the enter button on this calculator is not the equals button, which I know it is on some calculators. The enter button is in the top row. You see it says enter at the very top there. So Type in a number of decimals you want, let's say five, hit the enter button. Now, we're going to stay in this, this format, so what you may as well do is hit the down arrow. You'll probably have to hit the down arrow um, a few times, all right, and eventually you'll come up to the uh, mathematical uh, precedence or priority page. Now, I'm hoping, if you press the down arrow, it's probably four, maybe five times, I'm hoping your display will say AOS. If it does, then fantastic, you don't need to make any changes. All right? um, AOS is basically um, all about knowing the correct order or sequence of doing a sum. So if, for example, you're doing a very simple sum of 2 plus 3 times 3, now obviously this is kind of a high school maths kind of question. Uh, what you should do, obviously, is do the multiplication first. So we should do 3 times 3, obviously it's 9, then add the 2, so the answer is 11. Now, if you had it set to AOS and you did that calculation and you did not bother to put brackets down, then the calculator will know and will respect the correct math math mathematical priority. So it'll get the answer of 11. However, if it says CHN on your display or chain, then it means it will do it purely in a linear way. So your calculator will do 2 plus 3 equals 5 times uh, ti uh, 2 plus 3 equals 5 times 3 equals 15. So if you went for chain, you get the answer of 15, which obviously is wrong. And if you went for AOS, you'd get the answer of 11, which obviously is correct. So if it does say chain, uh, you need to change it, and you can change it, as you can see on the display here, by pressing uh, 
um, the second enter button. Okay, so just run that through it again. So we've gone into the format command, so second decimal point or second format. We've probably, hopefully, changed decimals to maybe five, so five enter. Hit the down arrow, the down arrow on the very top row. Hit the down arrow a few times. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many, top, about four or five times. And you'll either see AOS appear. If you see that, fantastic, don't change it. If you see CHN, then the way you change it to AOS is by pressing second and enter. And you can play around with that, press second and enter, and you'll just toggle between these two settings. All right, so we want it for AOS. Now, obviously, AOS has limitations. Uh, a simple sum like 2 plus 3 times 3, it will know to do 3 times 3 first. More complicated ones, which might involve multiplication, powers, maybe uh, uh, powers which themselves are a multiplied number. You know, so 3 times 3 to the power of 2 times 2. Those kind of more complicated questions, you're going to have to start putting brackets around. And there's a limit to what the calculator can do, but, but simple ones, it knows what to do. Okay. So there's your uh, mathematical uh, precedence. Okay. okay, clear the screen. Uh, clear the screen down the bottom left. Uh, also, it's worth checking uh, the number of payments per year. Now, again, if you've got a relatively new calculator, these come out of the factory set to one, which is what we want. If you have a slightly older calculator or maybe borrowing someone's, just check they haven't changed the setting beforehand. Um, so what you can do is, again, press the uh, payments per year, which is a P stroke Y, and you'll see that in yellow um, above the uh, I stroke Y button. So we're looking here at the third row from the top, second button in, where it says I stroke Y, and above that you have in yellow P stroke Y. So you press second again to access the yellow command, I stroke Y, type in the number one, and then hit the enter button, and that's sorted. If it says one, then fantastic, you don't need to do anything. So now we've got our calculator set up, we're going to be uh, working through a few key functions. We'll be looking at the uh, third row from the top, which is used for a whole variety of things, you know, present value, future value, etc. We can look at the cash flow function, which is just to the right of the yellow second button. We use that for uh, more sophisticated sort of uh, cash flow structures, so we have irregular cash flows. We're also going to be looking at the data and the stat function. So these are our main ones we'll look at today. Right? But before we do it, though, let's just think about interest rates, because before you do any kind of present value or future value, you're going to have to do interest rates. You're going to have to compare one set of interest rate to the other set of interest rate. Um, and as you probably know, these terms like nominal rate and effective rate, um, we have to be able to work with both of those. Right? Now, we'll come back to the memory function in a second. I'll, I'll do that within a form of a little example when we go through the next question here. So let's look at nominal and effective rates. Okay. Now, just a recap, um, the nominal rate is uh, also the stated rate, is also the quoted rate, um, and if you're not told otherwise, we assume it's the nominal rate. And what the nominal rate is, is the interest rate that's appropriate for that time period, multiplied by the number of times that time period goes into a year. So for example, if you were borrowing money for one month and you were told that the, the one month rate was 1%, then the nominal rate would just be 1% times 12 would be 12%. So in most situations we quote rates in a nominal way uh, purely to make it easy for us to get to the rate we want. So if we're doing our monthly cash flow, therefore we want a monthly rate, it's quite easy to take the number of 12, which is quoted to you, and divide it by 12. Okay? The effective rate, however, is a compound rate, and therefore it represents earning interest on interest on interest. So if you are being charged 1% a month, then over a year you'll be having 1 plus r to the power 12, take away 1. Now, now that's a much, much harder calculation to do, much, much harder. Um, if you work it through your calculator, I haven't got uh, the answer to hand. It's, it, it's 12 point something. I mean, it's a much, much harder calculation to do. And of course, if you're quoted, let's say, you know, 12.3, I haven't got the exact answer, but it's magic 12.3, and someone said, okay, now what's the monthly rate? Well, I don't know about you, but I can't do this in my head. I can't take the 12th root in my head. So it's much, much easier 
to be quoted in nominal than effective. Okay. Now, you could, of course, uh, do it from first principles. I mean, if you're good at maths, you could take the 12th root, etc. Or there's a fantastic little um, shortcut on your calculator. So let's look at the shortcut you have uh, on the calculator. So this is just a recap of what we've been talking about here. So if you're 8% is the nominal and uh, you're paid six monthly, then the, the interest rate you'll get every six months will be 4%. Remember, the nominal is the interest rate for the period times the number of periods in a year. So therefore, working backwards, you know, 8 divided by 2 equals 4. But if the compound or effective rate would be where you're getting 4% on 4%. So that, of course, would be 1.04 to the power 2. And then we take away the 1, and we get the answer of 8.16. If we're interested paid quarterly, then that means every quarter we're getting 2%. Therefore, on a compound annual basis, we'll be getting that four times. Obviously, that gives us the answer seen here of 8.243. So again, as I mentioned earlier, it's quite hard to do this calculation in your head. It's much easier if someone says, hey, I'm going to quote you a rate is 8%, and that's on a nominal basis. You can easily divide 8 by 4. Uh, however, it's not easy taking the fourth root of uh, 1.082. Four, three. So, so that's a good recap we have here. Let's move on to the shortcut, though. It's a fantastic shortcut, and this is on your calculator. If you look uh, down the bottom of your calculator, all right, you will see uh, the letters I convert. If I briefly go back to the blow up of our screen, uh, the I convert, you'll see it's above the number two, so right down the bottom of the, uh, the calculator. Yeah, right down the bottom, above the number two. So remember to press the yellow command for I convert. You want to hit the yellow second button. Okay, so we're going to second I convert, which is the number two button. Yeah. And then it's it's pretty intuitive. There's only three fields. Right, you only ever have to populate two of those three, and you can compute the third. Okay, so let's imagine we want to do that uh, last example of eight percent. So eight percent was the uh, nominal rate. So you press second, I convert. It'll probably come up showing nominal. If not, just hit the up or down arrow. It doesn't really matter. You simply go in a little loop and to hit to nominal. Type in eight. The eight has to be a percentage, uh, not as a decimal, but as a whole number. Hit the enter. Again, it makes no difference whether you go up or down, but whichever direction you go, you'll eventually come to the C stroke Y, cash flows per year. Let's go for two. And then hit enter, and again, up or down, doesn't really matter, until you find it says effective or EFF, hit compute. And if you do that, you will find the answer of 8.16. Okay. Equally, you could work the other way. Where it says effective, let's put in the answer from previously of, of 8.243. So that's the effective one. Hit enter, and again, up or down, doesn't really matter. Uh, until you see cash flows per year. Go for four, hit enter, again up or down, you know, you may have to, uh, one may be quicker than the other, but it's still pretty minor, and, uh, and eventually you'll go around to where it says nominal. Hit compute, and we know the answer, the answer will be 8%. So, very, very useful way of switching between uh, nominal and effective. Okay. Now, let's imagine you've done some uh, calculation. Um, imagine you've got an answer here, 8 or whatever, or, or maybe the first one, you've got the effective rate of 8.16, and you want to keep that answer uh, in your calculator in memory function. Well, that was sort of the slide we had a few months ago, but we'll do it quickly here. So, you've got nine memory functions in your calculator, uh, and they are numbered 1 to 9. So, let's imagine we want to uh, save this answer on my display, yeah. or, or, or I'll save the 8% or any answer, doesn't really matter. Um, all you do is you press the STO button, store button. Now the store button is on the uh, first column on the left hand side, and it is uh, quite near the bottom. So if I go back to my calculator, so left hand column, you'll see it, there we are, bottom third store button, STO. And the one below it, RCL is for recall. Okay, so if you want to store a function, once you've got your answer, 
All you then do is hit store and then give it an identifying number. So any number between one to nine, so let's go for store one. And that'll be put into the memory. Now this is, a, I guess, a bit of a problem, from honest, of this calculator. Uh, the display doesn't actually tell you you've got something saved in memory. Right? You have to, a bit of a leap of faith where you have to assume uh, it's now uh, recorded. Right? But now you can clear the screen. If you want to get back that number, you hit the uh, recall button, and then you watch which of the memories are you recalling. You're going to recall memory one. Right? So you have nine of these. You could do store two, recall two, store three, recall three. Uh, the other um, way is a kind of a, um, an, a, a, a continuous memory function is you can always derive or find your last answer, and that's by pressing uh, second and the equals button. That will give you the last answer. But to be honest, I prefer this approach, uh, and this just means I can store any number, uh, I can nine of them, and recall them. So, okay, we can now get to our, our interest rates. Okay. Um, and remember, if you're doing a present value or future value calculation, the rate you use has to be consistent with the time periods you're working with. Okay? So if you've got monthly cash flows, then the time periods would be the number of months, and the interest rate has to be a monthly rate. All right? And that's why I said, going back to my earlier example, if you're quoted an effective rate of 12 point whatever, 12.3%, let's say, it's quite hard to do a 12th route calculation. But it's very easy if I quote a rate of 12 where you can divide it by 12 and you get the monthly rate of 1%. So the R and the N have to be consistent. Okay, so let's use this then uh, to do some uh, present value calculations. Right? And we're going to be focusing initially on this third row from the top of your calculator. Right? Now, you can solve for any one of those buttons. You could solve for N, you can solve for interest rate or yield, solve for the present value, future value, etc. It doesn't really matter which one you can um, uh, you want to work with. So let's go through, uh, hopefully nice and uh, straightforward. Right? Um, so $2,000 for five years at a compound rate of 4%. Now, here we are assuming, because we're not told otherwise, that each time period is annual. Okay. So 4% is an annual rate. So that would be an effective rate and also a nominal rate. Remember, nominal is the rate for that period times the number of times that period goes into a year. So 4 times 1 is clearly 4. So here we have 5 years. So 5N, 5 years, 5N. The uh, interest rate is 4%, interest rate or yield, 4%. The present value is 2,000. Uh, there is no payment. Uh, we'll deal with the PMT function a bit later on. The PMT function is used where there is a regular uh, a recurring cash flow. That doesn't apply here. Uh, so we can go for zero. And then compute the future value. Now, if you put that through your calculator, you'll find you'll get a minus answer of roughly 2,433. Again, I'm not going to bother with decimals. Right? Now, it's a minus number. Right? It's only a minus number because your calculator thinks as if it's like an investment, thinks in cash flows. So because I put that 2,000 present value as a positive number, it's thinking quite rightly that if there was an investment out there where you received $2,000 today, then clearly at some point in the future, you have to be paying money back. Right? So that's why the future value is negative. Equally, I could have made the 2,000 present value negative, in which case the future value would be positive. Okay? So in that example there, I didn't have a payment number. So I typed in zero to make sure there was no payment. The other way to do it, and probably both is quite a good way of doing it, is actually to make sure you clear this third row function beforehand. And that way, if your previous question had involved a payment, by clearing it, it kind of resets all the numbers to zero. So at the top here of the slide, to clear this function, we can have it here, highlighted here in green. It's a clear the time value money. Now again, if you look on your calculator carefully, you'll see that yellow lettering, clear time value money. It's above the future value button, so third row towards the right-hand side, in fact, on the very edge. And to, therefore, to access that yellow command, remember, you have to hit the yellow second. So second and FV, 
which is the same as second and clear time value mate. That will clear everything that's in the calculator regarding that third row. Okay. Okay, so there's a nice simple example there where the interest rate was an annual rate and the time period was a number of years. Okay. Okay, let's just change it a little bit and let's now think about six month time periods. Right? So we're asked about a six month interest rate. So if the interest rate is a six month rate, the time periods have to be in terms of six month time periods. So now we've got a three year example, but of course our time periods are no longer years, it's six months. So a three year ex time period, uh, or three years sorry, would equate to six time periods, six six month time periods. So we have six N. We have 5,000, which is our present value. That's gonna grow to a future value of 5798. And we're asked, what is the interest rate? So again, we can plug it in our calculator, so 6N, the present value, 5,000. There's no payments, so again, hopefully, we've cleared the memory anyway, but it's always good, safe practice, that not only to clear the memory, but to overtype any button you're not using with a zero. So I'll put zero payment here. And then the future value we had was 5798 spot 47. So enter those in and then hit compute. The compute button is the very top left on your calculator. Compute the uh, interest rate or yield. Now, if you've entered this exactly how I have done it, you're now gonna be looking a bit confused, thinking, hang on, what's going on here? I've got an error message. It will say error five, right? error five. And that's because your calculator is confused with the cash flows. I put both those cash flows as a positive number. And your calculator is thinking, hang on, that can't work. There's no such investment out there that pays you $5,000 today and then pays you a further $5,798 in N periods time. You can't have, one of those signs has to be negative. So that's the reason you have an error message. So either make uh, the 5,000 negative, in which case the future value will be positive, or make the 5,000 positive and the future value will be negative, okay? So, so whichever one you do, I'll make the 5,000 a, a negative. So to make it negative, you have to change the sign. Now the change sign button is down the bottom, bottom right. All right, it's, you know, if I highlight it here, down the bottom right there. So you hit, type in 5,000, then hit the plus stroke minus to change the sign, then hit PV. If you put that through now, so make the present value a negative and the future value a positive number, when you work out the uh, interest rate, it'll come in at 2.5, 2.5%, okay? Now, that, even that's not the right answer uh, because you never ever leave interest rates in a form other than an annual form. And what we've just worked out is a six month interest rate. We never quote it as a six month rate. You always quote it annually. And we said before, that's the whole point of the nominal uh, rate. It's the, the rate for that period multiplied by the number of times that period goes into a year. So the actual answer to this question will not be two and a half percent, but would be 5%. And again, I mentioned earlier, just to reiterate, if you're not told otherwise, we assume that we quote rates on a nominal basis. Okay, had they asked you for an effective, you know, what is the effective or what is the compound rate, then okay, it'd be 1.025 squared, then take away the one. But generally speaking, we go for a nominal rate here, okay? So okay, that's, we've worked out how to do a PV, We've now done an interest rate. You know, let's just play around and do a few more uh, of these functions. Okay. okay, we're now gonna introduce the payment function. All right, so payment. And this is to do with an, an annuity. Right? So an annuity is an investment that pays a fixed regular cash flow, but for a finite period of time. All right? So the cash flows will stop at some point. So here we're gonna do an, an ordinary annuity. Now an ordinary annuity, if we do like a timeline here, is one where the first cash flow and every subsequent cash flow occurs at the end of each period. 
So we're going to get $5,000 at the end of the first period, so time one, 5,000 at the end of the second period, and 5,000 at the end of the third period. Right. You may find in the exam they don't even use the word ordinary. They just talk about an annuity. So you assume this is the case. Okay. So the 5,000 is going to be our payment. Don't forget, good practice, clear this third row function first. So second FV or second clear time value money. And now we can input the details. So the payment was 5,000. There is no present value. You can see quite clearly in my timeline. There's no cash flow at time zero. The first cash flow is at time one. So again, if you've cleared this memory, you can ignore the PV function. If you've forgotten to clear it beforehand, then you have to overtype because we've already got a present value number in there from that last example we just did. Uh, interest rate is 5%, and it was three years, so 3N. And we end up with an answer of uh, 15762. Okay. Now again, uh, you may find it comes up as a negative answer, same issues as before. If I put that payment as a, a positive number, then the calculator is thinking, right, you are receiving three lots of 5,000. So at some point, you're going to make a payment back. So that'd be a negative 15. Or if you make the 5,000 a negative, it's like an investment account. So I'm investing 5,000 a year, then I'll end up receiving 1572. So just bear in mind uh, uh, the signs there. So maybe I'll think of an investment account. So perhaps I should have made that a negative number. And then the answer is a, a, a positive number. Okay. So there's our nice, easy future value for a normal, regular annuity. Okay. What if I wanted a present value of an ordinary annuity? Right? Well, like with a single cash flow, you should be able to go from a future value to a present value. If you took the future value of a single cash flow and discounted it by 1 plus r to the power n, you'll get the present value. Well, you could do exactly the same with annuities. So, yeah, it depends on the situation of the question, but if, for example, you already knew the future value of an annuity and you wanted the present value, yes, you could type in all the things again in the calculator or just take the future value of 15762 and divide it by 1 plus r to the power n. So divide it by 1.05 to the power 3 and you'll get the present value. Equally, you could take this present value and compound it by 1 plus r to the power n and get the future value. So, as is often the case, there's more than one way to get to an answer. But anyway, let's do the answer using this, these buttons of the calculator. So, three years, so 3n. The interest rate or yield is 5%. The uh, payment is 5,000. Okay. Again, I'll make that negative, so as an investment, I'm paying in 5,000 a year. Um, the future value, there is no future value. Remember, the only cash flows are three payments of 5,000. And I've already captured that information here. I've got the three for the 3N, I've got the 5,000. So again, zero FV is safe. If not, obviously clear the memory before you start. Then compute the present value, and we get the answer of 13,616. Uh, okay. Now, what about an annuity due? Right. An annuity due, all right, is a special type of annuity. It's one where the cash flow comes at the beginning of each period. So going back to that last example where we had our 5,000, so we had three, three cash flows of 5,000, 5,000, and 5,000. That was at time one, two, and three. If this was an annuity due, we will have exactly the same number of cash flows. But rather than waiting until the end of each period to get our money, we'll get at the beginning of each period. So the beginning of time one, that's time zero. So we have five there. At the beginning of time two, well, that's the same as the end of time one. So 5,000 there. Beginning of year three, well, that's the end of year two. So we've got three cash flows as before. But if I were to ask you which of these would you want, would you prefer, I think you'd absolutely say I'd rather have the annuity due. 
You know, I'd rather have the 5,000 straight away, because if nothing else, I could stick it in a bank and earn interest on it. Whereas with a normal annuity, you have to wait a year to get your first cash flow. And that's really the, that's really the, the nub of this difference. With an annuity due, you're always better off by that ability to invest that first cash flow for that first year and therefore earn the return. So you can quite easily go from one to the other and if you want to work out the present value of a normal annuity and then work out the present value of an annuity due, the difference is just going to be one plus r. Uh, similarly for a future value, the difference is one plus r. So I'll show you a way of working it out using your calculator but equally, you could do it in a more straightforward way by, by thinking through these differences. OK, so back to the example which we have on your slide here. So the present value of a four-year annuity, discount rate is 6%, where the first payment is received today. So that's the clue that this is an annuity due. So here's our timeline, and I really would recommend a timeline. It helps you, I know it's a little bit childish at times, but it really helps you making uh, really, really dumb uh, prop errors here. So here are four cash flows. The first cash flow though is at time zero. Right. Now, there's two ways you can do this calculation, as I said a moment ago. You can change your calculator setting, which I'll show you in a moment, or leave it as it is and just increase your answer by one plus r. So I'm going to do the, that method first of all. So your calculator is set up out of the factory to assume cash flows occur at the end of each period. Right? So, OK, what I will do is do an ordinary annuity. Work out an ordinary annuity, which we've already gone through. Right? So, you know, type in the diesel. So, you know, 4N, 1,000 is the, uh, the payment. Uh, the interest rate is 6%, so 6 is the interest rate. Uh, there's, there's no future value, and we can compute the present value. So this is a, an ordinary annuity without changing any of my settings. Right? And I work out my ordinary annuity, and it comes in, again, I'm not going to bother with decimals, but ballpark $3,465, which clearly is not the answer we have on our screen. But if you then take that answer and increase it, multiply it, by one plus R, that extra year of reinvestment. So here the R is 6%. You will get the answer shown of 3,673. So personally, that's what I would do um, because the vast majority of your questions in your exam would assume cash flows at the end of each period. And I'm always worried if I change a setting to make it beginning, I'll forget to change it back and then all my other questions are wrong. Yeah? Okay, maybe you're not, you're, you won't be as stupid as, as me, but I'm worried I'd make that mistake. That's, that's how I would do it. The other way you can do it is to change your setting. Right? So tell your calculator you want the cash flows to be at the beginning of each, um, of each cash flow. Okay? Beginning mode. Now again, you can uh, do this uh, if you look on your calculator. Um, if I, where's that picture? Here's one here. If you look on a calculator, uh, on a third row of the calculator, right, uh, you'll see in yellow, above one of those buttons, it's above the payment button, you'll see in yellow the letters BGN for beginning mode. So we need to access that command to tell the calculator beginning mode. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to press the yellow second, followed by the, the payment button or, or BGN button, depends on how you wish to view it. Now your calculator, I'm hoping, will say end, which is how which is the default, how we assume. You want to change it to beginning mode. And you do that very easily by simply pressing uh, second and enter. And you can toggle between the two, you know, second and enter, goes to beginning, second and enter, back to end. So if you change it to beginning mode by, so second payment, then second enter, it now says uh, beginning mode. You can clear the screen, input the details as before, you know, so 4N, 1,000 payment, 6 interest rate, blah, blah, compute the uh, PV, 
and you'll straight away get the answer of 3,673. And as a warning, your calculator will have in very small font on your display the letters BGN. So if you have gone down that road, I would urge you then to change it back. So to change it back, you repeat the steps. So second payment, then second enter, and it takes it back to end mode. Right? So that's your choice. If you want to work out the, the present value of an annuity due, personally, I would work out the present value of an ordinary annuity and increase it by one plus R. If you want to work out a future value of an annuity due, I'd work out the future value of an ordinary annuity and times it by one plus R. Yeah. Um, if you want to work out the payment, so perhaps I gave you the initial amount, so you're investing X amount, um, and it will have a future value of Y amount, yeah, and, and maybe you have to work out, well, what, what payment would equate that? Uh, so if you had to work out a payment, then I would do the payment of an ordinary annuity, and to get to an annuity due, you'll divide it by 1 plus R. Okay, I won't do an example of that today, we haven't got uh, that much time, but there's your choice, either do it from, I guess, a more fundamental approach, or change your settings uh, to uh, beginning mode. Okay. Okay, that's all quite straightforward, hopefully, just using uh, single cash flows or constant repeating cash flows. Let's now use the cash flow function, which is labelled CF. It's a button right next to the yellow second button. And the cash flow function is used for where you have uh, irregular cash flows. So let's have a look at an example. Now this cash flow function is quite a comp quite a complex worksheet. It's like having a little mini Excel sheet buried into your uh, calculator. And it can deal with all sorts of cash flows, you know, many, many cash flows. It might be an investment where for the first 100 years you get X amount, and then the next 100 you get Y amount. And it can deal with big numbers, lots of numbers, right? So it's quite a, um, an, uh, a decent um, uh, cash flow. Now, access it by pressing the CF button, we said, that's right next to the yellow second. Now, it's classified as a worksheet, and to clear what might have been there before, you have to clear the worksheet. So, so if you look on your calculator, the very, very bottom left button, where it says, where you used to clear the screen, if you look above the clear button in yellow, you'll see clear work. And that's, sh that's short for clear worksheet. So you've got to hit the command button first. So you've got to enter the worksheet first. So press cash flow button and then hit second clear work. There's no point doing second clear work and then the cash flow. You've cleared nothing. Right? So second clear work will clear that, uh, that, that, that worksheet. Okay, now we're going to enter the details. Here we'll use a little example we have here. It's one where we're going to have a cost of a thousand. Obviously a cost will be a negative cash flow. So press CF, then clear it, second clear work. Your display will sh ask you, or we're looking for CF0, the first cash flow. So enter that as a negative. Yes, yeah, so remember 1000, hit the plus slash minus button down the bottom right hand corner of your calculator, hit enter and then the down arrow, okay? That's all in the top row there. Then it will ask you for the next cash flow, cash flow at time one. So we'll go for 700. It's a positive, it's revenue, it's an inflow, yeah? So 700, enter down. Now if you press enter down, it, you'll see a display as an F01. F stands for frequency saying how many times does that cash flow occur. And clearly the 700 cash flow occurs once. So we want the frequency to be one. But if you look in your calculator, it already says one. It defaults to one. So actually you don't need to do anything. You can just press the down arrow again to go on to CO2. But instead, had it been said for the first 10 years you got 700, then you'd enter 700 for CO1, and where it said F01, type in 10. Yeah, um, uh, but here we're going to uh, just do one. Right? So CO2 is 800, it occurs once. So enter down, the frequency is one, hit the down arrow again. And then CO3, okay, now here it does occur more than once. 
So we can use that frequency button. So type in the 900, enter down. It'll, it will then say F03. I'll ask you for the frequency of that cash flow. So we're going to put in 2. Type in 2 and enter. Okay. So now we've got the information into our worksheet. And what we're going to ask the calculator to do is to work out overall present value. And we're going to be netting off the inflows, our revenue, basically, against the outflows, the cost, all in present value terms. Okay. So once you've got that information there, you can then hit the button right next to the cash flow button, where it says NPV. You can't miss it. It will ask you immediately for an interest rate because your display will simply say I equals. It'll ask you to put interest rate in. So ours was 6%. So put in 6, enter, down. At which point, the display kind of goes blank. It goes to zero. And I used to always panic in the exam thinking, oh, where's my data gone? But it's still there. Don't forget, once you've done that, to hit compute. Hit compute, and hopefully the answer you see is uh, there, 1,840. Right? What if they ask you for the IRR, or the yield of the investment? Again, fairly self-evident. Right next to the NPV button is the IRR button. So hit IRR. Don't forget to then hit compute. And the display should show, oh, it's about... 68%, 68.24% of a healthy yield. Right? I mean, you could have guessed that anyway, because you know, we are investing a thousand, and in present value terms, we're making roughly 1800. So we haven't quite doubled our money, but it's certainly somewhere between 50% and 100%. So the yield of 68 seems about right. Okay? Now, if you want some further practice of this, uh, here's another little example here, um, and answers down here on the, on the bottom of the slide. So have a look when you get a moment. Uh, the interest rate or the cost of capital is 10%. You can get to an NPV and an IRR. Okay. So there's our cash flow function, CF button. Okay. The last thing we look at is how to use data and work out things like standard deviation. So we're going to use in the, the data function. Right, so it may help to locate where data is. You'll see that above the number 7 on your calculator. It's a yellow command, so hey, press second and, and number 7. And then we're going to also be using the stat function. So these two work together, the stat function, which again is right next door. It's above the number 8. Okay, So hopefully you've located the, the buttons uh, that we need here. Okay, So let's go through and do an example of this. So here's our data. We have uh, five bits of data, and we want to work out the, the standard deviation, for example, of this data. Right? So we use the data sheet. So second and data. Remember, the data command is above the number seven. It's another worksheet. So like with the cash flow function, once you've entered that worksheet, clear the worksheet by pressing second clear work. All right? So the bottom left button. Now your display will show x zero ones, asking you for the first of the data. So we'll put in 30% or 30. Enter down. Okay. You'll then see y zero one, which is very similar to what we've been talking about a moment ago on the cash flow function. But rather than using um, f for frequency, we're using y, because let's face it, if you're doing a graph, like a histograph, histogram, your Y, your vertical axis, will show frequency. So you can see the similarity. So Y01 is asking us for the frequency of that uh, data. Now, 30 occurs once. Your calculator defaults to 1. So again, I mean, you could do, if you want to waste time, type in 1, enter, down. Or it's much quicker to press the down arrow a second time. So like we do with the cash flow one, if it only occurs one, just hit the down arrow twice. So, okay, now your calculator will ask you for the second one. So, again, enter 12, enter, hit the down arrow twice because 12 only occurs once. So, you keep on doing that until you get to your, your fifth value of 23. Okay, so that's our data function. So, 30, enter, down, down again. 12, enter, hit the down arrow twice. 25, enter, hit the down arrow twice. 20, enter down arrow, etc., etc. 
Now your data is in your um, calculator, you need to move over to the stat function. Right? You don't have to do anything here, you don't have to clear the screen, you can stay where you are, but now just press second and number eight, or the stat function, shall we look at it? And that will open up a new, a new sheet. Okay? And what it's doing is basically transferring that data into the, the bit of the calculator that does all the calculations. Right? Now, this calculator, with the Texas Instruments BA2 Plus, is, it has more features than we need for CFA. Right? Um, you don't, for example, in CFA have to calculate linear regression. And one of the, the functions of the stat uh, mode is to work out linear regression. So we need to, first of all, set the stat to the, to the right format that we need for the exam. Okay? I think if you've just got a brand new calculator out of the factory, it'll probably be set to LIN for linear regression. Uh, we recommend here at Fitch Learning you change that setting to the one that's shown here of 1 minus V. Right? And this is a, a setting and that allows you to use more than one variable. So here we only had one variable, i.e. the x's were populated. We didn't have anything for the y's. But if we had something for the y's, then this is the setting for that. Right? So I would use this one, it's a more flexible one. It can handle simple questions like this one and a bit more advanced ones, uh, which we'll uh, talk about in a second. Right? So if your display isn't showing 1 minus V, then you can change it by pressing second and enter. You may have to press it a few times and you'll go through a menu. So press second, enter, second, enter, second, enter. And eventually you will see this display come up at 1 minus V. Okay. Then once you've done that, the uh, question then is just, you've got that display, then hit the down arrow. And all the output from that data <laughs> will just appear in front of you. All right? The first thing you see when you hit the down arrow is the number. So that should say 5. All right? That's a really good check. You know, it's worth double, double checking and adding up. You've actually got 5 data. Here we've clearly got 5x, 5 bits of data. So that helps you see if you missed one. Hit the down arrow again, it gives you the mean of 22. Hit the down arrow again, you get the sample standard deviation. I'm sure you're probably aware of this from maybe school level, but uh, in stats, when we describe a sample, we, the notation is to use Roman letters, so S is a Roman letter, that's our sample. When we are talking about the population, data, we use Greek letters, so sigma is a Greek letter. So our sample standard deviation appears next, roughly 6.67, and our population standard deviation is about 5.97. Obviously, these are only standard deviations. If you want to have a variance, you can square them. Yeah. If you want to keep that number for some other calculation, stick in the memory, store one. So those memory functions we spoke about earlier, you don't, by the way, need to uh, erase the memory function, just over overtype it. So store one and then use that answer, maybe the questions about what's the sharp ratio or something, but uh, you can hopefully use the uh, memory function. Okay. So that's a very useful, uh, hopefully very straightforward uh, question. What we're going to move on to now is introduce the, the Y function on this data series. And we're going to use this for uh, frequencies and also for probabilities. Because a probability is just really a frequency of an event occurring out of a total number of events. So you can think of a probability as just being a frequency over n, isn't it? If something occurs 25 times out of 100, then clearly the probability is 0.25, which is the same as looking at the frequency as a proportion of n. So we can use that, that y command to introduce probabilities uh, here. Just bear in mind, uh, like we spoke about with the, the data, the probabilities have to also be entered as whole numbers. So if the probability was 25%, we'll type it in as 25, not 0.25. Okay? okay, let's do an example of how to do this on your, on your calculator. So here we have uh, three scenarios and three different returns. So obviously these, the returns would be my, my x data. So x01 is 3, x02 is 8 x03 is 14. And my probabilities, 20%, 30%, and 50%. Now again, on the slide here, um, 
we're showing you, if you like, from a, a first principles, how to work out the average return, how to work out the standard deviation, etc. I would, I would never worry myself about this first principle approach. What's the point? You've paid for a calculator, I could do it quicker and more accurately than you can. So let's move on to the calculator entry. So, from basics, second and seven, or, or data tab, and then don't forget, once you've done that, good practice, clear that worksheet before you start. Right? Your display now says x01, so we'll type in the first value of x, which was 3%, so 3, enter, down. But now we're going to use the y command. Right? So remember the display defaults to 1, we want to now type in the probability, and the probability for um, the first scenario where we got 3%, that probability is 20%. Right? So we'll type in 20, enter, down. And then it moves on to the second data. So we type in 8, enter, down. It then says, what's Y02? And again, it will automatically shows 1. We'll overtype that and put in 30, 30%, enter, down. And then finally, x03 is 14, and the final probability is 50. Okay. So then, as before, transfer that to the stat command by simply pressing second and stat, which you may remember is the number 8 button. The display now must be 1 minus v. That last example we did, that was quite simple. You could have got the same answers by having it as lin. This type of question, you must have it as 1 minus v. So to me, it makes sense to have it in this setting. That covers both. Remember, if it's not showing 1 minus v, second enter, second enter, second enter, and you'll toggle through a menu until it says 1 minus v. OK, hit the down arrow, n. n should be 100, because remember, we've done a probability as a frequency out of n, uh, and therefore it will sum to 100% here. Right? Uh, Press it down again, you get the average, the expected return of 10%. Well, we had that on the first principles approach, the expected return or average of 10%. Yeah. Press the down arrow again, you get the standard deviation. Yeah. So again, you can see this output here, and it's, it matches what we mentioned uh, earlier on. So although these are, say, not the only functions, they are absolutely the bread and butter ones for the exam. You've got to be all over that third row from the top, which is for simple single cash flows or repeating but constant cash flows. You've got to be all over the cash flow function, and that links to NPV and IRR. You've got to be comfortable with switching between a nominal rate and a compound rate, an effective rate. And again, although you could do the, the, the math approach, I'd recommend use that fantastic iConvert function. Love it. It's really good. Really good. Because remember, you need to have the interest rate appropriate for the time period. And they may deliberately give you a quoted interest rate in a way that's not very helpful. They may say the effective annual rate is 7.2%, and you've got a quarterly cash flow. You can't do that in your head, not easily. Uh, but you can divide any number by four quite easily. Right, so make that I convert button is very, very uh, useful. So if it was me and they gave me an effective rate, I'd go to I convert, stick in the effective rate, put the cash flows per year into whatever the number is, compute the nominal, and we'll set up the nominal, if I wanted quarterly, divide that by four. Yeah, so they're the, the most important uh, functions uh, we have here. Now, um, if you want some more help uh, from us here at Fitch Learning, obviously we have a... Uh, um, offices uh, all around the world. Uh, we have a global uh, faculty. Um, I'm sitting here in London at the moment, uh, but we also have offices in, uh, and classes running in North America as well. And we have a dedicated uh, faculty team out there. So if you're interested in more class, in some classes, we have a whole range of classes. All, all details you can find on our website. Um, anything from weekends, uh, evenings, uh, intensive programs, etc. Uh, we have an online platform called Cognition which is one of the uh, most sophisticated platforms uh, you'll find anywhere. Um, it's a, a platform that has genuine adaptive learning. So every one of you will get a sort of a tailor-made, um, if you like, product, 
So the, the software behind it will, will monitor your performance, will monitor your questions. Not only the number you got right or wrong, that's quite simple, but the type you're getting right and wrong. And it will just send you more questions of the type that you are getting wrong. And it will save you time by not giving you questions on those areas which you're going to get right. Let's face it, we all have busy lives. And let's imagine you've, got a, uh, you've done an economics degree, you may have a PhD in economics, you probably don't need to spend time wading through 200 economics questions. So what this program will do, it will give you a small sample. If you nail those, that sample, it will say, fine, you're OK, let's move on. Whereas the more kind of old-fashioned platforms will just say, look, here's our question bank, start here, finish here, and, and you're wasting your time. So cognition is really, really uh, effective. I'd recommend you have a look. We do have a, a demo uh, login you can have a look at. Right? And so it will provide you with this uh, fantastic uh, uh, adaptive learning. You'll also find in Cognition um, that the videos are broken down into very, very small bite-sized videos. So whether you have uh, 10 minutes to study or 10 hours, you can find a video that fits your time available. So the videos are broken down into small bite-sized with some simple questions to reinforce the video. And then say, once you've looked at a, a run of videos, there's a little test. And that's where the clever bit starts. So that test will give you a sample questions from our question bank. Those who've got an economics degree and a PhD in economics, when you're doing the economics test, you may find they give you 10 questions, you ace those 10, move on. Those who've never studied economics before, you may find that you have to, uh, your test will involve 30 or 40 questions because the, the um, underlying um, algorithm needs more evidence that you are okay and okay with that topic. So some of you will do a few questions, some many. So there's about 3,000 questions in the, the learning part of the uh, portal. The very, very strong candidate may do under 1,000 of those. The one that, where the knowledge is a bit newer to them will maybe be doing all 3,000. Right? So you have those, uh, those learning topics. And then when you move through the portal and you get nearer to the exam, there'll be all the mock exams, so five mock exams and many, many more questions and revision tools and mind maps, etc. So, so have a look, have a play if you uh, want to. You'll also find on Cognition a full, uh, full uh, uh, um, calculator guide which covers every, every single function. We haven't been able to cover uh, every function uh, tonight. Okay? Um, so hopefully uh, this session has been uh, uh, useful. Um, hopefully you haven't uh, gone to sleep and switched off too early. Um, if you have any uh, uh, queries, then please feel free to contact us and in whichever office it best fits your time zone. Um, and obviously there's a, quite a useful little discount there for those who are looking uh, to get some uh, more help. Anyway, thank you for uh, listening. So my name is Simon Hollihan, and uh, I, I wish you all your success in your CFA journey. Thank you.